All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, ACMA Advanced Track. Uh, thank you for uh, coming back after our uh, first workshop. Um, and today we're going to be talking about um, CNNs, or more specifically, um, convolutional neural networks. And uh, what they are, um, why we use them, um, and uh, maybe a little demo on what convolutions actually are. So that'll be pretty fun. So let's begin. Oh, yeah. Okay, so first, uh, a quick announcement. We have the uh, ACM census, which is uh, basically uh, this little survey thing. I just talked about it, but then it's it's in the recording. I got to talk about it again. But it it is this, this little um, Google form that helps us to understand uh, what you know the general members, people participating in ACM events, and it's not just AI. It's ACM wide uh, events. Uh, what their needs are, what their background is, what they want, so we can better cater events and you know workshops and you know professional opportunities, stuff like that. Uh, so this is the kind of um, QR code and link to doing it. Uh, we will appreciate it if you take like you know one or two minutes to do it. Yeah. So there's like, also yeah. a raffle which you can enter once you complete this form. Like there's a link to a raffle which you can join. So yeah, please please do complete it as it helps yes. like better serve you. Yeah. Cool. All right. So today we're going to be talking about the following things. We're going to be giving you a quick review of what fully connected neural networks are, if you remember from last workshop. Uh, and we're going to be talking about first the applications of CNNs to kind of motivate why we need CNNs in the first place. Uh, we're going to talk about the intuition and a quote unquote theory, but basically how CNNs works behind the scenes uh, with a brief review, convolutional layers and other layers, and just kind of common layers you may see in kind of a modern, relatively modern CNN network design. So uh, next slide. So let's talk um, what FFNNs are, or fully connected neural networks. So this is kind of, you may have seen this um, uh, last uh, workshop where we talked about the kind of general overall training heuristic of how you would train a neural network. Um, first, you got to define a neural architecture. Here's um, how, a neural, how a network is actually, um, you know, like, like how we basically go from input to output. I think that's will be the best way to put it. Um, we got to determine the number of inputs, hidden layers, and outputs. And this is kind of part of this whole architecture step. We're going to initialize our weights and biases to something. You know, like people can do zero initialization, but more often than not, we actually uh, use a bunch of statistics to uh, to actually initialize um, the weights and biases based on the actual number of parameters, size of the parameters, the type of activation function we use, uh, stuff like that. Usually, some sort of normal distribution with you know scaled by some constant. Then we feed forward through the network to compute loss. So basically, that's when we take our inputs. The network transforms this input a bunch of times. We get to some sort of outputs. We take we take the output, put it in our loss function um, with this you know the target labels, and together they give us some sort of loss that measures how well the neural network is doing. Um, in this case, the lower the loss, the better the network is doing. Um, so that's kind of de determining the output error. And then this step is what we're going to talk about, um, not today, but in, in the future, backpropagate through output layer to compute uh, the cost function gradient. So basically, this is how, um, does anyone remember what, why gradients are important uh, in neural network training? It was two weeks ago, so it's it, it makes sense. Uh, yeah. It's like the best direction in which to shift the weights and biases in order to get the most improvement. That is, that is correct. Um, in fact, it is uh, the, the negative of the gradient is the best direction, right? Because gradient is the direction of the greatest ascent. So the greatest descent will be the opposite direction. Um, so that's why calculating gradient is very important. And then we want to update our weights and biases using a gradient. We can do something as simple as gradient descent, or we can do some extra stuff to this gradient, maybe keeping a, you know, a running mean of gradients from the past uh, to uh, basically push the weights in a direction that hopefully will lower the loss. And we do this whole process iteratively. Right. Uh, again, feed forward looks a bit complicated, but um, and really, um, if you're talking about, like fully connected neural networks, we basically have this kind of matrix um, that multiplies our the kind of outputs from a previous layer plus some sort of bias, pass it through activation, um, and. What this matrix is, is basically, it, if you think about a linear algebra, it's, it's a linear transformation that basically takes a vector of some number of dimensions and transform it to a vector of some other dimension. You can think about it kind of, you know, taking this image, kind of extracting some level of features. We typically try to, you know, reduce the number of features by that. And so some sort of bias, because that's also a trainable parameter. So in this case, our weights and our biases. That's why we, we call weights and biases so often in machine learning. Um, now, any questions so far? Uh, anyone who, uh, you know, it's two weeks ago, so like that doesn't remember too much. 
Okay, cool. So I guess let's talk about CNNs now. And I, I want, we, we want to begin with the applications of CNNs and kind of why we use CNNs in the first place. Cool. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Owen. I'm subbing in for advanced track today, um, but you won't see me every week. Um, it's really nice to meet each other. Um, so one of the cool applications of convolutional neural networks is so, so convolutional neural networks are often used in like image recognition, image classification tasks. So one of the most useful applications is like detecting objects. So self-driving cars is a very relevant application. So you could do things like a train a neural network to maybe assign a risk score to a certain object. So like if this pedestrian, maybe maybe this pedestrian looks like the it's a, like they're coming towards you. So we wouldn't want to assign like a high risk, or you just want to like just generally classify what objects there are. Like if there's a traffic light or if there's a car near you, you want to like detect and identify where there is. So self-driving cars use convolutional neural networks. Um, they're also used on like Facebook, for example, where they like automatically tag the person who is um, who is who is in a picture, um, and they do that using like uh, something like a CNN or a transformer architecture, which is another um, type of deep learning architecture. Um, so these are like the two like more like image recognition related uh, applications of CNNs. But CNNs are also very good at like just extracting information from complex data and, and like encoding it. So CNNs, there's a slightly more advanced like uh, technique, but CNNs are also used as like encoders where like you would have some kind of information, you would like encode that information. Um, so let's say you have an image, you, you, you are encoding the information in the image, and then you can have like a language model, for example, to take that information and maybe like generate a caption for that image. So CNNs are also used in those kind of architectures. And also, if you um, is has it has anyone here heard of Dolly um, more recently? Yeah. Uh, so for those of you, show them. Huh? Want to show them? Actually, yeah. Why not? So Dolly is basically uh, for stable diffusion. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's. Ugh. Uh, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so Dolly two. So basically, Dolly is this thing that oh, being. Uh. It's fine. I don't think we have. Okay, cool. We don't have internet. That's okay. fine. Okay. So what Dolly is is um, this little bit of um, software. You may have heard of it as stable diffusion or something. That basically, when you type in uh, so, some sort of text prompt, it will generate an image from it. So like um, you may more commonly hear as AI art or you know, you know stuff like that. It's 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 a very kind of hot topic um, recently, especially since um, 2020 when a really important paper came out then. But basically, uh, those networks, the way they actually generate images, and kind of a lot of generative networks of how they generate images from some sort of pure noise, is by using um, convolution layers, um, specifically inverse convolution layers, where they kind of up sampling instead of down sampling. But the kind of the key thing about convolution is it works really well with images or some sort of spatial data when we're dealing with um, two or more dimensions dimensions of data, and you're trying to either create data or, in this case, recognize data from it because it is it. It looks at things spatially and preserves that spatial information. Um, so just as Jordan mentioned that they're really good at like spatial data, uh, CNNs, um, could anyone think of something that, that takes up like spatial data that you would store as spatial data on your computer, for example? A mathematical object is, is a clue. Okay, so graphs can also be stored in like a matrix form. You can write like an adjacency matrix for a graph, right? Like which edges the graph has. Um, so you can also like use a CNN to train it on like different types of graph problems. Um, cool. Um, so some context about CNNs. Oh, did you have a question by the way? Or I thought you raised your hand. Um, so they are a type of neural network. Um, so what that means is that just like any other type of neural network, they'll have some like linear layers at the end, um, which might have some kind of an activation function, but they'll have, you'll have linear layers in your model um, in addition to maybe like some other type of specific layers. So the specific type of layers that convolutional networks, neural networks have are called convolutional layers, or, and they also have another type of layer called pooling layers, which are unique to CNNs. And they, they perform like a really specific task. Um, they each perform a really specific task as we will um, get to know soon. Do you wanna try? Yeah, cool. Um, so why don't we think about um, an image? Like we have an image, it's, it's a two by two, um, it's, a, it's a two dimensional image and we wanna like feed it into a convolutional neural network. Um, well, if, if you recall in, in normal neural networks, we, we would feed input data in the form of like a vector. 
So um, if we wanted to feed this two by two image to a fully collect fully connected neural network, does anyone have an idea of like how we could feed it into that network? Just a normal neural network. If we have like a two by two, like two dimensional, sorry, image where we have like a width and like um, a length and like each row has pixels, how would we feed that into like a normal neural network? Does anyone have any ideas? Just like making making a matrix with like number of pixels. Is it a matrix specifically? What kind of an object is that? Okay, yeah, it is a vector. So you wanna. So what we're gonna do is basically. Um, so we we will flatten out the image so that all the rows of pixels are in one row and they form like one large vector. So if you wanted to maybe train like a fully collected new connected neural network on an image recognition task, we would like squeeze out all the pixels and feed it as like one single dimensional vector into the neural network. And actually, one this is a huge disadvantage as it turns out because. Um, could anyone think of what problems might happen if you just like take an image and you just squish it into like a line of pixels? Wait, you, you have like a grid of pixels, but instead of the grid, now you just have like a line of pixels. Are you losing any kind of information there? The position. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So if you have a grid, you still know like what objects might surround other objects, right? But if you were to just like stretch out those pixels, um, you lose that kind of like positional information, which is why fully collect, fully connected neural networks aren't best suited for um, uh, for for image recognition tasks. So um, why why don't we go to the next slide where we actually look at a fully where we like look at fully collected, fully connected neural network. So you can think of like, just like us, like stretching out the image as an input layer in the input layer. And then basically every single layer within the neural network would take in um, the activations from the previous layer. So these, so for example, it would take in the pixel values. The first layer would take in the pixel values from here. And then it would, it would, it would do like the WX plus B as I'm sure everyone is familiar with. Um, it would do like WX plus B. So it would use its internal weights. Um, and, and compute double X plus B, apply this activation, which would then forward propagate. Um, so you could you could like squish an image into that and forward propagate and back propagate. Um, you can achieve like pretty reasonable accuracy on a data set such as um, MNIST, as we will see pretty quickly. Um, but in CNNs, what, what we're doing is we're working with volumes. So um, when you think of an image, an image doesn't actually just have a it isn't actually just two dimensional. It doesn't just have like a width and a height. It also has like a depth. Does anyone know what the depth could mean in an image? Color. Yeah, exactly. So um, there are three, there are usually three channels. If we call them channels for co or colors. And they, um, traditionally they're like RGB. You might also see like um, red, blue, yellow somewhere else. But um, so basically, um, so, so, so basically each image has like three um, kind of like matrices stacked on top of each other. That's how each image is represented in like a computer. And we want to find a way to feed this like this, this kind of like volume into our CNN. The way that works is um, with, with the help of something called the convolutional um, layer. But yeah, I guess that doesn't go into that right now. Yeah, so. So we're going to see events. Visual like regular neural networks, they're made of multiple layers. Each layer takes some sort of input volume and it produces some sort of output volume. So, it, so if you think about the kind of normal neural networks, we're kind of just taking a vector, kind of doing this kind of bunch of linear transformations, uh, adding biases and stuff like that. What uh, CNNs do on a very, very high level is it takes in some sort of 2D or 3D object, does some sort of transformation, and we're going to talk about what that sort of transformation is, and gives you some new, maybe extractive features. That's also, you know, going to be in 3D. That's kind of what CNNs are. Yeah. Um, so these are the type, different types of layers you might see in a convolutional neural network. So if you are to code like a, a convolutional neural network in PyTorch, for example, you will have to like create these layers yourself. So there will be like an input layer, which would hold the original image a convolutional layer. So this is a new type of layer, which we'll be discussing today. Um, basically what this convolutional layer does is it would take in like the image itself and generate like a, what is called a feature map. So basically it's going to like survey the image and it's going to pick up like any, any features it thinks are important, like some certain shapes or like some edges, like someone's face, for example. Um, so that's what the convolutional layer does. Um, ReLU is an activation function that we'll be using. So basically ReLU is used after, so basically, con when, when the convolutional layer make a filter map, 
you can use Relio on the filter map as well. Does could anyone like freshen up what Relio is for us? What what is what does Relio exactly do? I my Relio last time. Oh, you mean didn't? Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, we're gonna talk about that in a bit. But the, does everyone remember what sigmoid is? Right, like like this, this this idea of we having this you know kind of like negative infinity to infinity possible amounts of outputs, and we're kind of kind of clamping it, or like kind of smoothing it out into between uh, zero and one. So what Relu is, it's a different type of activation function. Does anyone remember what activation functions are? Um, first of all, it's like whether the weight, the calculated weight, to be added to a like result. Right. It, it is something that we add to our results, right? So after we do our, you know, our WX plus B, our kind of linear transformation, our linear layer, usually what we put at the end is some sort of um, activation function. And if you remember, the purpose of doing that is to add nonlinearity, right? Because if we just have a bunch of linear transformations applied right after one another, together they're one big linear transformation. So we're actually unable to generalize to more complex data that cannot be, let's say, separated by uh, some sort of linear line. If you're kind of think about this geometrically, so stuff like sigmoid it allows us to draw kind of decision boundaries because you know in classification problems we're, we're drawing decision boundaries that are not just straight lines but actually curved lines, well, you know lines with angles and stuff like that. Relu is it, it is a, a kind of an alternative to sigmoid that we can use. So instead of clamping everything between zero and one, all we do is we just kind of get rid of the negative path, right? We just say let's chop it off, make it zero. Everything else keep it exactly the same. That's why it kind of has this kind of just angles look there. And this is actually what we use predominantly today. Like almost every single deep learning paper you're going to see, their activation function is going to be this or some variance of this or something that's based on Relu, right? And a little bit later, we're going to be talking about why we use Relu when we get into a little bit of what led up and what kind of made the modern neural networks, uh, sorry, convolutional neural networks uh, layers today. Because Relu, despite being how popular it is, was really only popularized slash made the standard in 2012. And there's a reason for that. But uh, you want to continue with the uh, other layers? Yeah. So my apologies. I, I wasn't familiar with, not familiar with Relu. But yeah, that's an activation function. So basically what it does is it kind of like helps your neural network learn more complex type of functions. Instead of just like linear relationships between variables, an activation function like lets you learn more complex like relationships. Um, we also have something called a pooling layer, which we'll be looking at. The pooling layer basically looks at the feature maps generated by the convolutional layer, and it's going to like sort of summarize those features because we might see we might see later um, when we generate feature maps. Sometimes, like if you're training neural networks on like um, high high quality images, for example, or higher high or like a huge data set. Um, it, it, a high quality image, for example, would create like huge, like bigger feature maps because there might be more features in a higher quality image, in which case we would want to like kind of like summarize the features because at the end of the day, we, we, um, we're storing like all of our parameters and in our, in our, um, in our, in our GPU when we're, when we're doing like forward pass, for example. Um, so we, we want to like keep our parameters to a low. So the pooling layer kind of helps us summarize the convolutional layers extractions. We will look at it in more detail. So it, it, so yeah, that's just 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 keep that in mind for now. Um, and then the final layer, final layers, we might have like a few fully connected layers. Those are the layers you might see in like a normal neural network. Basically, what that does is it takes like the feature maps generated by the convolutional layers, like all the features. So, so basically it has this like list of features you can think of like, okay, there's like a circle in this part of the image. There's like a triangle in this part of the image. And what th this like fully connected layer, uh, what fully connected layers would do is like kind of like add those things up together and then make a prediction. Um, so it would be like an n dimensional vector. So for example, if you're predicting uh, between a dog and a cat, that, that vector would be two dimensional. Um, so if it's, if you want to predict dog, for example, we would, we would, we would have one as like the value for like the, the first position in the vector and zero as the value for the second position. But if you want to predict a cat, for example, it would be zero one. If, if any, everyone's familiar with that, um, does that make sense? Are there any questions about the gen? Oh yeah. So this is, this is actually like a great visualization. Um, so let's say we have like a colored image. Remember that this image itself has like a certain depth. Um, 
So yeah, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to take an image, apply something called like a convolution using our convolutional layers. What it's going to do is like it's going to scroll through the image kind of, and it's going to like pick up certain features, which is going to store in like a feature map. So, so this right here is like the feature map I was talking about. So it's going to extract features, store them on this. Then the pooling layer might like compress the features into like a smaller summary. Um, and then we can apply a convolution on the summary. So you can think of like, this convolution kind of fi finding even more complex features than the first one. So maybe this convolution finds like straight lines, like just like horizontal and vertical lines. And this one, this convolution maybe like adds them up together. Like it could add up that there's a horizontal line here, there's a vertical line here. So I'm going to add them up and that's a square. So that, that's kind of like the rough intuition between between like the rep, the repeated convolutional convolutional and the pooling layers. They kind of like extracting complex features, and then you you'll have like a fully connected la layers, which are like this, which is exactly the same as like the layers you see in your normal neural networks. Um, they're basically going to get all these extracted features, and you would like, and they would like learn to predict the correct class. Um, so this is like the entire architecture. Yeah, and like um. Being really clear about which type of layers we're talking about is very important here because um, unlike feed forward and network layers, we have now different operations being done at every single step. So I think it's very important for us to kind of formalize it. For example, there's a convolution layer, there's a pooling layer, there's a fully connected layer. It's a lot of words, and they may not make too much sense right now. In a little bit, they make may may make a little bit more sense, but you know, like um, you can kind of just bear with us here. But the, because understanding that you know how, the different things that these layers do um, kind of helps you also intuit what a neural network is trying to do as well. Any questions so far before we continue? On like the very general overarching overview of what convolution networks are. Okay, cool. Let's continue. Uh, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, what is some? Yeah, so so basically, this is just kind of like a picture of what our neural networks look like from next last week. You, you can kind of think of like every single pixel as a vector. You know, we do this kind of thing. It's just a visualization of mm -hmm. what. Yeah, so they they just like flattening that image right there into like just like that straight vector I spoke about, and they kind of feeding it into like a vanilla neural network or like a normal neural network. Um, and and this is kind of what the first layer will look like. One one of the really cool things about neural networks is um, the layers actually, when, when it has been trained, actually does represent certain things. You kind of start to notice a few kind of local features. And, you know, like with smaller images, that may be really nice. But we may be running into a bit of a problem with this. There we go. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, like I mentioned earlier, one of the issues, like you mentioned, what was your name, by the way? Oh, Peter. Peter, yeah, Peter mentioned that one of the issues that can happen with like just flattening out an image might be that you lose like some kind of positional uh, information. So yeah, it is sensitive to translation. Um, so for example, we might see the same image or the same cat here, but in the if you use the same approach as in the previous slide where we just like flatten the image out into a vector, like this is going to be the first pixel, right? And this is going to be the first pixel. So you can see how like, the neural network will see it as a completely different image. So it is sensitive to translation and it also does not scale well with like larger image, images because for larger images, what we're gonna have, we're gonna have to have like, let's say our image is a thousand by thousand pixels. We're gonna have our input layer be like a thousand by thousand by three. That, that's huge. We, yeah. we can't afford to have that. Like so. let's kind of really hold, hold in how little, like like why vectors don't at all preserve spatial information. Like you can imagine like this eye, for example, right here, let's say it's like pixel 500. But if, if it's here now, it may be like pixel 200. And to the neural network, pixel 500 and 200 are very, very different things. They may represent completely different features. So if they are kind of like this far apart, if the neural network, if you're just talking like a fully connected neural network, it's not able to generalize and say, oh, these features, groups of features may be going in different places. But, and, and again, because kind of images are stored kind of horizontally, this pixel and just the pixel a little bit down, maybe 100 pixels apart. And this image is like 100 pixels wide. And neural networks, um, and it's very difficult for, you know, fully connected neural networks to kind of make that sort of connection, especially since let's say you scale the image by a little bit, suddenly your neural, neural network can't tell the difference anymore. So that's kind of the idea. So how do you see this address this issue? Um, cool. Um, yeah, so Jordan was, so fun fact, 
um, I was assigned this workshop yesterday, so I am kind of reading the slides at the same time. But uh, so because I'm not familiar exactly what the slide carries, but so sparse, uh, so sparse connectivity or value in the output values. So it's a subset of the input formula. Do you want to address this one? Yeah, sure. Okay, so so in this case, um, the idea of sparse um, connectivity is that um, basically. Um, with CNNs, because we're only looking at local features, a lot of times what's actually influencing um, our final outputs is only a part, parts of the image, right? And we can kind of, uh, and the filters can, can, can learn to only um, extract information from parts of the image instead of the entire part of the image. And so that's kind of what sparse connectivity means. Um, like, like it's, it's a very complex thing that basically says for fully connected neural networks, it tries to use every single input pixel to, for it to mean something. Right, but for convolutional neural networks, that's not really what it's trying to do. It's more looking at local features, and it's kind of the the idea of like if something hits, good. But if something doesn't hit, then that's maybe not as good. So it kind of addresses that issue. And the second thing is parameter sh sharing. This is very important because if you think about having like let's say a, a sort of like you know one million pixel input, which is actually not that big, it's like one thousand by one thousand, I believe. Um, if you think about having like a one million pixel input. And let's say we map that inputs with a neural network to say a one thousand, um, uh, a one thousand dimensional hidden layer. Then that matrix will be one million by one thousand. That's one billion parameters, and uh, your computer will stream. So basically, because uh, full hidden neural networks tries to look at every single pixel and relate it to every other hidden layer in the next layer. It's very big and in a way almost sort of wasteful. So one really amazing thing about full, uh, CNNs is that um, because it uses the same filter to convolute throughout the entire image, even if the image is really big, as long as kind of our filters, the, the convolutions themselves are not of a super large size, it actually saves on the number of parameters, despite it being technically a more complex operation. So. And then, so, and, and lastly, of course, it's not sense the trend, trend in that case. Cool. Any, Any questions, questions so far? The... Again, like, 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 we're still going very high level, we're, but we're slowly narrowing it down to what's actually happening. Yes. What, what is the hidden layer exactly? Right. So a, a hidden layer is actually, I'll maybe like draw it out. So a, a hidden layer is really actually just um, like this. So you have the input layer and you have the output layer, right? The hidden layer is just anything in the middle. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's. That's just what we like to call it because again, hidden because we can't see them. And generally we're like, they don't really mean anything to us, right? It, it, it will represent some feature that means something to the computer. Convoluted, pooling, those all are- They're all hidden layers. Basically anything that's not the input or the output, we call it a hidden layer. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Okay, so let's talk about what a convolution layer is. Yeah, let's talk about convolution layer. So, which is, remember this is the feature extracting layer. Yes. Cool. Um, so, so this is this is so this is like an image. This is what an image might look like, right? Um, and you can consider like each like empty circle being like one pixel in the image. Um, so we're gonna make use of a terminology of, of uh, we're gonna make use of something called a filter. Basically, we're gonna use a filter to look at like one particular part of the image. So, um, so in this case, we're looking at this top left part of the image, and we're gonna look at this huge section of the image, and we just wanna extract maybe like one, one. We just wanna extract some information from it. We don't wanna store the entire image in our network, uh, or like store like store a parameter for each of these neurons. We just wanna extract some information. So we're gonna move. We're gonna. Oh, no, 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 this is just like a visualization. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so, the, so yeah, the yellow thing here is the filter and the green is the image. So you can see the, the filter right here is slowly moving over the image and calculating these like feet, the, this, this thing called like the feature map. So with each convolution, it's going to collect, uh, to cal it's going to calculate one value for the feature map. And the way this works is if the image is three, uh, three, has a depth of three, then your filter will also have a depth of three. So you can kind of think you can. So if you have three layers in the image, the filter will also have three layers. And when you so basically what you're going to do is you're going to kind of take like the dot product of the filter. Um, is there a way we can pause?
on, on like uh, not not really but like um what this really is is when we say dot product we just mean like imagine this filter being convoluted over everything at any certain step we look if we are overlapping the filter and the image itself we're basically taking like the first of the pairwise product right we're just taking the pair we're just multiplying the filter value here by the image value here filter value image value filter value image value so we multiply these together these two together these two together and we're adding, adding them, them all, all together. together and that's how you get this result in value right here yeah and um this is a 2D case, but if you think about it in terms of 3D, um, we will, the filter in this case will kind of be also 3D as it kind of tries to look at this, you know, image in this kind of 3D oh, slice yes. and yeah. multiplying every, everything together pairwise and then summing the results of all those products. Does that make sense? What's happening? So even if you have a 3D image, your filter is going to be 3D. So your output is only going to be just like one number. Yeah. For one convolution. Yes. So in this case, your output will just be one um, we'll just have one channel if you think about it in terms of depth. Does that make sense so far? Is the filter example like is that actual is is it is that actually relevant to the actual fil filter values we use or no. is it just a no, like just one zero one zero one question. zero? Yeah. Yeah. So the, these filter values are values that our network actually learns. Those are the parameters that a convolutional neural network is supposed to learn. Yeah. So basically, like. These filters are basically just like, oh, what number should I learn so that I can pick up on the filter or the features in this particular part of the image. So our goal here is to memorize these like filter values. So it would be like the, the red numbers at the bottom, right? Yes. Yeah. Basically, we are not determining what the filters are. We're not the one designing the filters. If you think about kind of how normal neural networks are, our weights is like the big W matrix, WX plus B, so WMB, right? In this case, our weights is the filters themselves. Basically, we randomly initialize the filters to something, and it, it may look less intuitive how we may compute the gradients to it, but we can't because it is an operation that we define. We can have some way of computing the gradients for these filters, and then we'll be able to then say, oh, let's perform gradient descent on these filters. Basically, how do we nudge the value of these filters such that, you know, after we do all these convolution you know, within the context of this entire network, we get to, we get to some sort of lowered loss. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so is the dot product like kind of sped up with GPU vector instructions typically or? That is, it, yes, it, it, it is. Because one the one thing that GPUs are really good at is doing things in parallel, right? And there are obviously ways for us to kind of abstract this out into some sort of linear algebra operation as well. Um, but yes, um, the reason why we want to do this with GPU is because we do a bunch of things in parallel. If you're thinking, it, it, if you think about, let's say, you know, like, um, because we have to do this so many times, we can do all of them in parallel because the GPU has enough cores. So that's why we want to use GPUs as well. Any other questions on this visualization? So, yeah, um, I actually just wanted to address, like, the point from, like, the, from the, advantage, uh, the advantages of CNNs, which is, like, parameter sharing. So if you look at the feature here, you see that for, for the image, uh, so if you look at the filter here, sorry, you see that for the image, we're just using one, like with this filters values aren't changing we're using just like the same filter values for all of the image whereas if we used like the previous like fully connected neural network approach um where we have like this we, we flatten out our image and feed it into like our first hidden layer for example then the very first neuron would have like a w1 through like w10,000 for example if our image just has like 10,000 pixels so would like the second neuron so with the third so with the fourth so we're severely reducing the amount of parameters we we're storing in our model by parameter sharing yeah. by using filters and for some terminologies uh a filter in this case is a, again a volume of waste that uh, moves across or convolves the inputs. And if you think about it, let's say our inputs kind of feature map or our input image is three channels. Then our filters will uh, then a three by three filter. We need a size of three by three by in this case three in in each channel. How, however, because we're kind of doing this whole kind of dot product operation, summing them all together and putting them, and that's just one of the values. And we're kind of doing this throughout the whole image. What happens is our output is still just one channel thick. Right. So if we want to extract multiple feature maps, what we can do is just have, let's say we want to extract 64 feature maps out of this. Then we'll have 64 of these three by three by three filters. And we'll kind of let all these 64 filters convolve and then we'll form the sort of output feature map that is, you know, 64 channels deep. Does that make sense? Again, this, this may sound a little bit confusing, but we'll, we'll try to reinforce these a little bit later as well. And so I have a question. Um, if you use like 64 filters, um, how do we make sure that the filters learn like different values from each other? Like, 
because if you think of it, the filter, if you go back to the previous like diagram, the filter values are something that our CNN has to learn. So like these values that we are multiplying the image with to extract features. Um, well, well, like how would you make sure that the 64 feature of like the filters don't converge to like the similar similar values? Any ideas? It's actually very similar to how you would avoid like similar weights in a neural network. Let's say we, we, we start off with like filters in like this initial state and after training, they're in like a fin finalized state, right? After we like feed data into the CNN, how do we make sure that the filters don't take up like the same values and, they, they, and that they don't end up just being like one filter and memorizing the same features? Any ideas? Okay, basically there, there are like many different algorithms for initializing the, the, the uh, filters. And that's also what they do for um, more simple, uh, simple neural networks. They initialize the weights with like different types of algorithms. Um, they do like studies on these and see what, what, what accuracy is highest um, using which kind of algorithm on different like problems. Yeah, so it's just like a, a, an algorithm which does that. You could also like um, randomly initialize your filter values, but then like it might not converge to as good of a minimum as like one of the algorithms would, which have been developed in a research lab. So yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's okay. yeah. So uh, oh, one more thing I want to talk about is the stride because the filter um, has to move across the image, right? Um, the default is kind of just oh, you just move, you know, pixel pixel by pixel by pixel. But we don't actually have to do that. Sometimes we may want to reduce that sort of redundancy information, and we're like, oh, there's a lot of overlap we're looking at. Maybe we want to downsample the sort of output features, and to do that, we can um, actually define the stride as something different. Instead of just moving per pixel, we can let the filter move every two pixels, for example. And then we'll kind of construct an output feature map that's slightly smaller because we're kind of doing this dot product less number of times. That makes sense. Okay. So with that in mind, um, what is the size of this filter and what is the stride of this filter? Just as a quick exercise. The size is just three by three. Yeah, it would just be, yeah, it's right. just one. The, the stride is one. That is exactly correct. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, again, this is just kind of like a more of a feature. <laughs> the window has the same deficit input. Yeah. So we talked about this. Um, Spencer so about volume. Talked about this. Okay. So yeah, that's that's basically kind of how CNNs kind of, kind of work on a relatively high level. Um, or like convolutional know, layers. Yeah. How how convolutional layers uh, work? Uh, any questions so far? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's continue. So a convolutional layer consists of multiple filters of the same shape. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so just like in vanilla neural networks, we have like the bias value, right? For each neuron, the neuron would add like a bias to after doing the double X plus B. Um, we also have like a bias vector um, it, it, here it, it, for each filter, there's like a, bi a, a bias um, value that the filter memorizes. So it, it, it won't only do the dot product with the image, but it will also add like the bias element. So, and, and remember that, that, the, that this is just like an extra feature for a neural network to learn. Um, the, it can, if the network wants to, it can always set the value to zero if it, find, if it sees that it doesn't need a bias. The network itself will set the value to zero. So cool. Um, yeah, kind of just like a visualization slash, you know, an intuition of what the network will be looking for as it kind of scans an image. So why do filters help? As I kind of talked about, filters reduce the total number of weights in our network as each slice of the output volume corresponds to a single filter, aka a single set of weights. Like if you look at, if you look at it here, we kind of have like in our CNN layer size of three by 64 by three by three. That is like what, like, like 27 times 64. That, it, like, like that's only around, I think, like a thousand, uh, five, a thousand to five thousand. That's my general estimate doing mental math. But like, that's not a very large number of filters, right? So, sorry, that's not a very large number of parameters because we are doing this sort of reusing as we scan across the image compared to fully connected neural networks. And, and the most important thing is filters also allow the detection of relationship between pixels. Um, what does that really mean, right? And 
because as we're scanning through the image, we're trying to take dot products and we're, and we're trying to um, kind of take this sort of, sort of dot product um, through chunks of this image. If you have um, um, some feature that relies on this kind of spatial relation, a filter is able to, to, to detect it. And most importantly, filters look for features, right? And you may be like, well, how do filters look for features? It's just dot products. The key is this. Um, let's say you have, if, let's say, um, let's think of a really simple example where it's just kind of like a one by one example. And the filter all it wants to do is want, it, it wants to look for if this number is positive. And let's say if the number is positive, then um, the filter will give something that is, um, you know, really big positive. And if it's negative, then it will give something that's really negative. If, then all the filter has to do is, is it can just initialize itself to also be positive. Because if two values are similar, right? If, if let's say we're looking for some sort of feature and these two values are similar, you multiply them together, you just get a bigger value of the same thing. However, if two values are different, aka if one of them is positive and one of them is negative, you multiply them together, you get something really negative, right? So basically, if filters that resemble what the image actually looks like will basically help us um, because of this kind of multiplication rule of two pixels are similar, multiply will become bigger. Two pixels that are not similar, multiply will become smaller, allows us to do this kind of filtering process of, oh, if the output map of, of, of this filter is like at this, pix at this chunk of pixels is really big, then that may mean that, you know, this feature is here. And if it's really small, then that may mean this feature is currently not here. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, another thing, that another kind of natural question that some people might, might ask is, okay, our filter is like three by three, five by five, how big can it be? But what if the feature is much bigger, right? Oh, actually, we talk about that a little bit later. But what if the feature is much bigger? What if the feature is, let's say, 64 by 64 pixel in the, pixels in size? I, I, I want you to keep that question at the back of the head, but then because a little bit later, we're going to talk about how we're going to be able to also look at features that are much bigger in size through having a bunch of CNN layers. So let's continue. Uh, yeah, so hyperparameters kind of keep track of. Um, does anyone remember what hyperparameters are as opposed to normal trained weights parameters? Our, our input? Uh, yes, our input. The, the parameters of the model that we decide, right? So we, we may decide them you know, based on validation um, accuracy or something like that. But basically, um, in this case, it, it is the choices that, uh, that that we make to design this neural network, right? So in this case, it's the number of filters. So basically, what is the output volume? AKA, okay, how many feature maps do we want by the end? The stride of the filters, how how kind of um, rapidly are we moving? And then zero padding. So um, we'll, we'll see what zero padding is and why it's important. And this is for each convolutional layer. Yeah, for every single convolutional layer, we can define a different number of filters, different stride of filters, and different amounts of zero padding, depending on what we want to do. Yeah. Okay. So basically, the purpose for zero padding is we may want the output volume to have some sort of specific spatial arrangement. And, and that may sound really confusing, but all that means is this. So. If you look back at this image, we have a five by five input image, right? And we have a three by three um, um, filter that's kind of moving through this image. And our output is three by three because, again, our filter can't move off the image. But what if we want the input and output to be the same size? That seems like a reasonable ask, right? Like something's going to preserve the size of the image. The, size of the features because we're extracting information off the image. Sometimes we may want to do that. And the solution to doing that is just padding zeros on the edges, right? Because if we pad zeros kind of outside on the edges, we're able to move the filter kind of slightly off and kind of only look at this four by four chunk. And when we do that, we're then able to construct um, a, a sort of convolved feature, a sort of final feature map that is the same size as the image. And you may be wondering, well, how, how does this help? It mostly, it mostly helps when we want to have cleaner math. For example, um, later we'll talk about something called max pooling or pooling, which we, um, when we start, say, from like 64 by 64 image, we may want to pull down to a 32 by 32 feature map, then to a 16 by 16 feature map, then to an 8 by 8 feature map, et cetera, et cetera. When we do that, 
and we don't have this kind of really nice mathematical property of like our inputs, you know, image and our output feature is the exact same size. When we do that sort of downsampling, what happens is suddenly we have to do a lot more math to figure out, wait, okay, hold on, we're, okay, we're, we have this size of filters, we're chopping off one pixel on each side, and then when we divide by two, that's a different number, and that gets really confusing really quickly, right? So just to kind of make our design neural networks easier and the math that we have to do in our head to of like keeping track of the, of the feature map size as we have more and more CNN layers more clear, what we will do is we'll add the zero padding on the side to make sure after we do the convolution, um, the, the final output is uh, the same size or some desired size that we want. Does that make sense of why we may do zero padding? And uh, yes. Can we do zero padding after applying the filter? Because wouldn't it be the same result? Uh, it wouldn't be the same results, right? Because if, let's say we uh, do zero padding um, after um, the filter, right? So we just have a, like, like a bunch of zeros on the side, right? However, if we do it before, what happens is, let's say a filter is over here because we did a zero padding. It's still able to capture information that's just in these four pixels. So our, our final output here would actually won't be zero. It will actually be something that's meaningful. But that's a great question. Um, um, Basically, uh, the whole point of zero padding is that we still want to squeeze out any last bit of information that we could. Because if you think about it computationally, it's not that much more expensive when we do it more hands. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for uh, this little section. And yeah, this is just kind of like a visual of what happens if you have like a bunch of different um, filter layers. Um, I'll just kind of let it play a little bit. So we kind of have like, you know, three separate filters working all at the same time. And, you know, this, these are our filters and, um, and we have kind of our, have our outputs here. You can think of it as kind of like our RGB channels. And then our RGB channels, we have you know, these three things that corresponds to it. And we get two output feature maps. Make sense what's happening? Yeah, yeah. So just to clarify, this right here is one feature. Oh, sorry, one filter. It's th uh, it has depth of three, just like the image. So th th this this part of the filter would multiply with the lowest channel in the image. The the middle one would multiply with like the middle channel, and the topmost would all multiply with the topmost. And this is just like another filter entirely with yeah. the depth of three as well. And both of them has have their bias like elements yeah. which you add on in the end. And intuitively, you can think of them as extract as looking at different features. Maybe this one's looking at is are there vertical lines? This one's looking at are there you know curved lines or something like that. If you want to think of it in a higher level of intuition. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, this example specifically is different than like layering the features in order to derive like more complex ones, right? Because it's they're not really the two filters don't really have any relationship to each other. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah, that's a good observation. The two filters don't really have any observation with each other. However, that's, this is our first convolution layer, right? Let's take this result. Think of it as in this case a three by three image with two channels, and we add another convolutional layer. Suddenly. We're, more, we're doing multiplication and additions between these two layers. And we, we then will be looking at the relationship between these two filters. So do you see, are you starting to see how like stacking different convolutional layers will be able to extract more complex features? Yeah. So that's kind of like the intuition behind convolutional layers and why they work so well. Because even though, you know, maybe if you just look at one layer, the different feature maps seems like they have nothing to do with each other. When we, when we then go to the next layer of feature maps, we will be able to kind of look at the relationship between them. Okay, next slide. Oh. Where is the first? That's fine. Oh, is that? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. So um these are some like like real world example filters and what they may look like. Uh, as you can see, because this is the first layer, it is it is not able to look at really big things, but then it is also the thing that we're able to best visualize. Like for example, we have a layer that is kind of looking at some sort of you know patterns that are like looks like this and you're you know, you have some rainbow stripes you know like like uh, like this is kind of generally what kind of folks should look for kind of just like a visualization of this um and again like these things these are things that the computer learns from, um on quote unquote on its own right this is the things that we learn via grading the sets so this is not something we design this is just something that the the, the network will learn when we feed it a bunch of images does that make sense okay cool. um actually just a general disclaimer so usually um 
when you want to evaluate like the performance of your model in, in at least in deep learning you all you have is like your evaluation metric usually like your AOC score or like your cross entropy loss or whatever kind of metric you're using i guess cnns are like one of the few um like deep learning models where you can actually see kind of like some visual uh, understanding of what the weights actually represent but it, you can think of like language models where like the weights are just like some decimal numbers and they don't mean anything like absolutely anything to you so this is like a very up and coming field of ai it's called explainable ai it's basically developing systems which actually make like meaningful decisions which humans can like interpret later so like um if, if like a cnn was uh, like so somehow trained to like maybe assign, give a code, give like a verdict to someone like assign like uh, a prison sentence to someone we would want it to be able to explain why it assigned like a particular score right so that is like a very active actively developing field of ai and one of the issues with deep learning is that sometimes like the numbers don't make sense it's just like it, yeah it's just like you kind of just like experiment with the things till they work almost yeah so uh, here, I actually prepared a, oh, actually, yeah, before we continue, any questions so far on why, on, on what we have talked about? Okay, cool. I actually prepared a little demo, um, which is um, basically if you manually put in a filter and a convolution on an image, what happens? Uh, I forgot we don't have internet. Uh, How do we open the slides? Huh? How do we get the slides? That's actually a great question. How did we open the slides? If we didn't Maybe have the more page. Uh, Let's see. I Connect to the network. Oh. Oh, cool. yeah. Try this. Can you just Google? Let's just Google. Uh, oops. I can't screen share from here. Do you want to try using an iPad? Cool yeah. Do <laughs> you think browser has not a bad choice? Yeah. You want to try that? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just give us a sec. Yeah, give us one. Oh, by the way, we have like a lot of candy, like Haichu, Boki, M&Ms. Yeah. Please come up and take I'll them. leave this up and here. And like chocolates. Yeah. I'll leave this up and I'll pause the recording. For those watching the recording, <laughs> I've already resumed recording, but basically if you go to this notebook, it is this very fun little notebook that uh, allows you to play around uh, with uh, different kernel slash filters. And what happens when you convolute it on top of the image, in this case of Alan Turing, you can see we can blur images, we can do things like edge, edge detection slash sharpening and some other weird stuff. And it just kind of shows the power of what, you know, these very simple little kernels can do with extracting features off of an image. Okay. Any questions so far about this quick demo that we gave? Okay, cool. Um, then, then, then let's talk about something that I think is a very fundamental part of um, oh, reconnecting. That is not good. Okay, let's not exit this screen then. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep, keep going through. But basically, okay, this is now. Let's talk about something called pooling layers. So. What pooling layers are is we have three objectives. First, we want to reduce the spatial size of our features, um, so um, height and width. We want to reduce the amount of parameters in computation, and we want to control overfitting. So, with those three objectives in mind, what can we do? So, if you if you look at kind of like general uh, layer patterns, um, really was typically uh, so sorry, Maxwell is typically applied after the weighting, and uh, right. So what max pooling is, it's basically just kind of, it has this kind of like um, sliding window size, in this case, let's say two by two, and just says, all right, let's take the maximum value from each F by F section. That's all it does. And because we're looking at kind of each F by F section at a time, we're able to down sample um, feature maps. That's all this is. It, there's nothing trainable. It is a predetermined operation um, that we get. And you may be wondering, how, how is this any helpful, right? So uh, again, the, a different version of it is average pooling. Where instead of taking the maximum, we're taking the average. So uh, in this case, it's, it's kind of more uh, the sort of down sampling you may, you may be more familiar with, right? So uh, yeah, some common practices. But, but basically, the reason why we want to uh, do max pooling is this. Remember how I was saying about features um, when they have features that match, it's like a really big value. And when features don't match, it's a really small value, right? What max pooling allows us to do is basically say, um, instead of basically doing average pooling, when we're doing max pooling, it's basically say, okay, let's keep the features that are important. 
the really low values, that means nothing's matching, right? That, that part of the feature map doesn't matter. But the really high parts, that's the part that we're interested in. So that's what max pulling is. Um, and gen that's also the reason why, um, empirically speaking, max pulling generally performs better than average pulling. And uh, there, there, there's also some you know, kind of common features we can uh, look at with uh, max pulling or pulling in general, which is um, the actual window which we're looking at, so F, right? So how big of a window we're actually looking at, and the stride, how much this window is moving at a time. So if we think about like a, you know, a, a window size of two and a, a, a stride of two, we're basically looking at every cluster of two by two pixels and picking the biggest pixel. However, we can also make the window slightly bigger and um, we can actually have some sort of overlapping pulling to really make sure, oh, this pixel is like right in between two windows and it's really important, let's sample it twice, why not? You know, so, so um, in this case, um, if you think about like, like, oh, what about padding? The thing is, it's uncommon to usually use padding in these pulling layers because what we will do is we'll use padding in the convolutional layer to make sure that our output feature map is of nice size such that when we do sort of this kind of max pulling, it, there won't be any sort of, oh, you know, like a three by three at the end where like, oh, one column of pixel isn't considered because, you know, the, the stride that will move, move it off the pixel. So like the idea of doing max pull, uh, sorry, doing zero padding is that we have these sort of nice dimensions so that when we do max pulling, the math works out really nicely. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, can, can go up one slide? Uh, yeah. Pulling, yeah, max pulling generally performs max best in practice. So also, um, the, what we like to say is makes program more decisive in that basically um, it, it basically forces the feature maps beforehand to really be decisive about, okay, this is the best feature. I'm going to make it maximum instead of being like, eh, maybe it's good. It's going to be average anyway, right? Because um, because of kind of how we compute gradients, what happens afterwards to affect what happens beforehand. So that's something to keep in mind. So yeah, again, just a quick pulling comparison. It, you kind of see here how like with average pulling, because it's kind of indecisive and, you know, you know cool. And it kind of takes averages, it's much darker. But with max pulling, the feature map becomes much clearer of you know what's going on. You can, at the same time, you can see that um, here in max pulling doesn't pick up anything at all. Like yeah. darker pixels. So darker pixels have a value of closer to zero. So the max pulling would tend to pick like higher valued pixels, which are which tend to be like the lighter pixels. Yeah. Um, so like if you have, for example, like this very niche data set where your background is white and like Maybe you have like some words written or some numbers written uh, in black, then maybe average pooling in your first layer would make more sense than max pooling. But yeah, yeah. in general, max pooling just works much better. Yeah. Oh, and one more thing, right? Because kind of like um, the purpose of max pooling is uh, to downsample, and the process of downsampling allows us to be able to, you know, uh, reduce the number of parameters. And specifically in this case, reducing the number of parameters is not just uh, as computation. Reducing the number of computation because then uh, subsequent layers, they don't have to move and do that multiplication nearly, nearly as much. But specifically with parameters is after we do this sort of like a bunch of, we generate a bunch of feature maps, right? And we kind of uh, want to feed it in into some final fully connected layers. What we have to do is take every single one of those feature maps, basically concatenate them and just flatten them out into one big vector. We don't want those feature maps to be huge because then we're dealing with the same problem again where, where our final fully connected layers are like absolutely massive. In fact, that is actually the problem with a lot of initial CNN networks is that the final fully connected la layers literally take up like 90% of the weights, despite honestly not contributing that much. Um, if, if you think about like, you know, intuitively how CNNs work. So by kind of doing this really aggressive downside sampling every single layer, we're able to take in inputs of like, in the case of image at 224 by 224, which is like 4,000 something pixels. And we're able to take that really, really big image, downsample it a bunch of times, and basically have like a final feature map of like, I don't know, like four by four or something. And even if you have like a bunch of different, and you gotta compensate for that really small feature map by having a bunch of feature maps, 256, for example. And by doing that, when we eventually find this out, we actually have um, a kind of feature vector that is uh, considerably smaller than if we just kind of fed this image through a fully connected neural network in the in the beginning. And most importantly, it is a feature vector that extracts the most important features about the image instead of just kind of throwing this as massive image at a time. So then it, our fully connected neural network at the very end will have a much easier time of discerning what the hell it's dealing with. Does that make sense? Yeah. So because of that, you may be wondering, well, we can downsample with max pulling, but why don't we just do it with normal convolutional layers and stride instead? Why don't we just get rid of max pulling altogether and just use stride? Because if you remember here, right, instead of doing this sort of like really 
sort of max pulling, why don't we just like at the convolutional layer uh, level, instead of moving, um, you know, with a stride of one every time, it's not auto play, but like instead of moving with a stride of one every time, it, we, oh, it is play. We move by a stride of two every time, right? Because we're kind of skipping a, uh, skipping a pixel every time, not skipping a pixel, but like, because we're moving with more, um, with a larger stride, our final output feature space will be smaller, right? And if you say that, you would actually be 100% correct. The advantage with downsampling, um, with just using a stride instead of using max pooling, is that this downsampling process is now learned, right? Because the convolutional layer now understands, oh, wait, I'm actually downsampling. And again, it's like a very high level intuition. Ingrained is just a bunch of math. But because it understands that it is downsampling, not only is it trying to extract features, it is trying to extract features at this sort of strider rate, right? And because of that, you actually sometimes achieve results that are better than max pooling because this kind of downsampling process is learned. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, could that also lead to potential problems with like more overfitting? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like one of the major things about pulling is it mitigates overpulling because it kind of has that you know untrainable like, un that that untrainable layer makes it so that you know the um yeah it, it, it definitely mitigates over um overfitting. But um that's what you will see like nowadays with some papers they just don't use max pulling and uh, they just use like some sort of stride down sample images and that's the reason why so like when you're designing neural networks something you can actually test is what if instead of using pooling i use stride or vice versa so that's actually another sort of quote unquote hyper parameter such design architecture design choice that you can make when you're um, constructing neural network does that make sense okay right uh let's take a break what's happening right now it's 8 10. okay let's take a break and afterwards we actually don't have that much left um, yeah, we, we basically just, we're just going to talk about like modern CN designs and how CNNs are used to predict stuff. And afterwards, we have a very short code um, to see if you remember stuff, but also just uh, a chance to win some um, some high juice and whatever, and Aussie just grab stuff you want. Yeah, and also stickers. So yeah, let's take a three minute break. Oh, I got to drink water as well. Let's pause this. Okay, so now we have. A CNN that's able to kind of do this whole you know level feature map extraction. Let's let's talk about how it's able to um uh let's talk about how it's able to actually make predictions. So first of all, we need some sort of way to compute predictions for each class. Um, for vanilla uh, neural networks, we use we use softmax. And again, if you don't know what that is, I don't think we covered it um, um, in the first workshop. But basically, what what softmax does is it takes like kind of like our, our raw outputs and basically um, transforms it into a sort of probability distribution of how likely um, it is that this image belongs to each class, for example. So um, particularly, the the issue is convolutional layers don't output vectors. Let's get a bunch of feature maps. So, and it's like the outputs are three D. It's it, the height times width times um, the number of channels. And if you're talking about uh, you know batches, it's four D. Right? We have an extra batch in the front, and we want to convert that output to a vector. So how do we do that? I, I kind of talked about this a little bit already, but basically, we just want we use fully connected networks, and we basically just flatten all those um, all those um, uh, three layers, right? Like if you think about it, we just have to take like each slice of three layers and just kind of concatenate it all together. Right. And basically, just like layers in the middle of the neural network, we unroll slash flatten the output of the last layer before the fully connected layer. And we can forward propagate the uh, flattened outputs through the fully full connected layer, like in the vanilla neural network. So you can kind of think about it as like with the output feature maps, we flatten it and we basically feed it into a normal neural network and try to, try to figure out what those feature maps will be. And that's kind of what's happening at the very end here. We have a bunch of feature maps, flatten it into a vector, and we can put it through a fully connected layer. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, any questions so far um, about this? Okay. So uh, before we talk about this, actually, uh, because I mentioned this um, a, a, a little bit before, which is, I mean, I'll probably put this here, is how is neural networks, uh, not neural networks, how are convolutional networks able to understand um, global features, right? Because if you think about it, um, let's use this. The, this image. If the kernel sizes are only three by three or five by five or seven by seven, how is it able to look at much bigger features? Like for example, if we have a 1000 by 1000 image, how is it supposed to look at curves that span that amount? 
does, does anyone have any idea of how it's able to do that? Now we have the knowledge of max pooling, of strides, of what convolutions are we doing. Uh, I don't know if it relates to that, but it's we're doing a we're doing a feature extraction. So basically, like line will converge all together to make a curve. Kind of. That's part of it because we're kind of looking through the entire image, right? And then you, you, and then maybe you know when we have that output feature map, it will represent something. However, is there any way for us to basically say, well, you know, throughout this whole image, this entire boat of like, you know, of, of a few hundred pixels, and this entire cluster means a boat. And the key is this, right? It, it goes back to, um, to, to the idea, to this idea that we were talking about at the very, very, very beginning, right? We mentioned, uh, here. Local receptive fields. So what are local res receptive fields? Basically, well, what a local receptive field really means is relative to the original image, what is this neuron aware of? In the first layer, this neuron is aware of a five by five pixel, right? Like that's all it's aware of because that's all we, we have done calculations on. However, with subsequent convolutional layers like these, I'll go back to here. In the very beginning, an output neuron or feature map is only aware of a very small chunk of pixels, right? However, when we take that output feature map and we treat it as basically a super high dimensional image, and we do the convolution again, and what happens is a new pixel on this newer feature map is looking at five pixels on this feature map. And these five pixels is looking now looking at a bigger area of the image. So the local receptive field of this neuron on on this feature map is now bigger. And it can be made even bigger when we do max pooling or strides. Because when we do max pooling or strides, we're downsampling this, this, this filter, right? Um, and we downsample and we kind of do a convolution again. Suddenly this one, one group on this um on this or the feature map that we're looking at corresponds to a much bigger area of the image. So by kind of continuously doing this process of convolution plus max pooling or some sort of downsampling, we're able to basically at the almost at the very last convolutional layer, the feature maps are actually looking at the entire image because that's just how local receptive fields are. At every single convolution, lo local receptive fields get big, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Specifically with pooling, it gets basically doubled in size every time, at least double in size, it, it, usually a bit more than double. And because it's doubling, it grows exponentially. So just after a few layers, we're able to look at the entire image and be able to extract information about the entire image. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's kind of what this is. And oh, any questions so far? Okay. I believe this is our kind of last topic of tonight, which is Raylu. Um, and why <coughs> Raylu? So basically, the reason why we use Raylu is actually a discovery, um, let's see, discovery in 2012, the AlexNet, right? I, I want to give you a little, little quick, uh, quick history lesson, very exciting, about um, the, the evolution of CNN networks. So in 2010, I believe, um, this thing came out called ImageNet. So ImageNet, uh, I've roughly talked about it last workshop, but it's, it's this collection of like a few million images that are pretty big, like 224 by 224 in size, and it has a thousand classes. So it is a very, very difficult image classification task, task right? And in 2010 to 2011, the winners of that competition, which basically says who can guess the, you know, for every single image, guess five categories. If one of the categories um, matches the actual label of the image, because sometimes the labels can be a bit ambiguous, um, then that's say, okay, that you have guessed that image correctly. And, you know, you're trying to get the highest accuracy of that possible. We call it top five accuracy. Um, back in the days, um, in 2010 and 2011, the methods that people used to get, uh, the, the methods that the best papers used is actually not deep learning. It is not CNNs, not even neural networks. It is just like a bunch of really, like like a combination of like k-means clustering and like a lot of feature engineering. You have a, this sort of like sliding window approach, but instead of actually doing any sort of, it, but you're actually doing feature engineering. So like you're actually designing some of the kernels yourself. It, it, it's like a bunch of different methods. Like there's this method called back words and uh, that, that basically it's, it's like tries to, cut out a bunch of slices of an image, do a k-means clustering, find the mean feature of each image. Like it's it's a lot of things, right? It's these are very complex methods of a bunch of things thrown together and they're able to get to around like you know 25% 25% error, right? So they guess 75% of the image is correct. 
in 2012. AlexNet, designed um, by Alex Krzyzewski, uh, Alex Kr 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 Krzyzewski from the, Univers from the University of Toronto, basically said, wait, guys, we just we can just use convolutional neural networks. Because convolutional neural networks has been first proposed all the way back in like, I think the 90s by um, uh, Lacoon, right? Young Lacoon. He is currently a distinguished professor at, 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 at um, NYU. And basically he is the person, the person who basically says, guys, CNN's work. Because um, back in the days, he basically um, worked with, I think, UPS uh, or, or USPS, one of them. And they basically created the first hand, handwriting recognition system. So that's kind of where MNIST came from as well. Where basically they automated this process of looking at um, male um, like, like, you know, hand, handwritten mail labels and basically say, okay, let's digitize that and be able to put that into a computer system and track where packages are. Before that, there has to be hundreds of thousands of facilities all around the world uh, or, or around the US with, with people basically just entering these, you know, addresses manually. But because of his work, people were able to automate this entire process. But after that, there was a slight problem because the type of activation function that young, that, that young Lacoon used was sigmoid. If you remember what sigmoid is, you know, that, that kind of flying into zero and one, right? If we take a look at sigmoid, uh, where, where did I put the pen? It's fine. Uh, it, okay, okay, so if we take a look at sigmoid, um, because one thing you want to keep in mind is that we're trying to compute the gradients of these sort of um, neural networks. If you look at sigmoid, which looks something like this, right, y next. And you were to look at what its derivative looks like because that's what gradients are, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because, because I can't write kind of on, on both, so I'll like write this in, right? So we do something like this and you look at what its derivative looks like. What happens is even though this is between zero and one, its derivative actually caps off at around 0 0.25. So if you think about how we're doing backwards propagation, or how we're computing the gradients, every time we calculate the gradient, we pass through this sigmoid, the change is kind of quartered. And we're basically doing quartered and quartered and quartered. And what happens is the deeper the neural network is, the smaller our gradient becomes. So that's the vanishing gradient problem. And one of the kind of primary rules in neural networks is we want our gradients to be big in that we don't want this romantic vanishing gradient problem because then what starts to take place is you have issues with like basically floating point numbers because then numbers become imprecise and our gradients become very low quality and we don't want that and for the longest time even with something like 10h which instead of um uh, yeah actually sigma should be like here actually this is this is actually more like 10h so sigma is here 10h is that even with 10h you still have that issue where at the very left and the very right hand side when, when the values are near infinity because it's so flat the gradient is near zero so what happens we have a bunch of activations that output really big values what what happens is there's no learning because the gradient is close to zero when we're doing gradient descent it doesn't push those values that much and that's very problematic and people for the longest time couldn't really figure out what to do until someone came came along, basically um, Alex and said, "Wait, guys, 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 let's let's uh let's just use this thing. Let's use Relu, right? Like Re Relu. The idea of Relu isn't a new thing. After all, it's really just a max function. But Alex that is the first one that really popularized the use of Relu because they showed that um by using by replacing sigma with Relu in convolutional neural networks and being a, a bit more careful with the process of training, training deep learn deep neural networks is possible." And that's really in 2012 when deep learning became a thing, right? Because people realized, wait, we can have a bunch of layers and still have gradients? Whoa, right? And so then suddenly, bringing a bunch of neural networks of a bunch of layers became possible. And in, in a sort of like high level heuristic sense, the, the AlexNet was much simpler than its predecessors. And guess what? It improved um, the accuracy, uh, the, the, the error percentage from 25% to 16%. A 9% drop in one year. And that is what started a whole trend of basically people trying to improve this neural network architecture, this CNN architecture, this really deep CNN architecture, and basically having like, I think nowadays they're like 1%, 0.5% ResNets um, neural networks out there of like hundreds of millions of parameters. But still, before you couldn't even have hundreds of millions of parameters because you have green, this, the gradient managing problem. And in hindsight, you know, this sort of thing seems really obvious to us. Like, yeah, of course, right? Uh, but it is kind of these, like, like 
that, that's why I think um, machine learning, despite it feeling like it's a very saturated field nowadays, and it's like moving so fast, we're going to hit some sort of bottleneck, bottleneck at some point. There's no no more thing to research. A lot of times, the solution is kind of just hiding right, you know, you know hiding right in plain sight, right? And a, a lot of times, like it, it is these advancements, these like honestly really simple heuristics that work so well that these are the things that kind of has pushed machine learning forward, especially deep learning forward. And um, that is why kind of understanding Sigma and understanding these things is really important because then you understand what are the limitations of current things and what other alternatives can we look at. So um, this is why we use Relu because it almost solves or at least ad very greatly addresses the um, um, gradient vanishing problem. Now, you may look at Relu and be like, okay, but like what if our values are all negative, right? It's just it all gets zero now, the gradient is zero, you know, it gets killed. There's a, there are a bunch of um, kind of solutions to that. Basically, the, the main thing that people do is actually they just kind of say, okay, instead of this flat thing, let's just like let it taper off like that, right? It's 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 actually called leaky relu because you let a, let a bit of values leak, and basically that amount of gradients is, is enough for basically um, us kind of push values into the positive um, part while still maintaining that nonlinearity. And like, there's a bunch of different improvements to relu that basically it's trying to keep a bit more information here, trying to make sure that this part's smooth because if you think about it, this this is not differentiable, right? What's the what, what's the derivative at this point? It's undefined, right? Usually in practice, because no output value is truly exactly zero, we just kind of arbitrarily set this point to be like a zero or one. But like, yeah, there's a bunch of improvements to relu nowadays, but relu is not just the original one, but it still performs really well. And most importantly, it is the most computationally efficient, right? If you think about computing the gradients, it's one, zero, that's it, right? So that is why ReLU is very important and why, like ReLU is basically made CNNs viable, I would say, or like make, made really deep CNNs viable and made image classification such a big field all the way up to 2018 when people got bored of it and went, let's start generating images. And now you have, now you have Dolly. So yeah, uh, any questions on that, on why we use ReLU? Okay, cool. Uh, again, uh, just a quick re recap on MS data sets, a large data set of handwritten digits. Um, it's it's kind of like almost like a subset of what uh, Yamakura was using for like the sort of um, address recognition in the beginning, I believe, I, or at least it sort of came from that. Um, yeah, this is AlexNet. And basically AlexNet, what it is, is it, like this is kind of like an architecture map of what it is. It starts out with a 224 by 224 image, spells out a convolution with an 11 by 11 kernel, pulling, convolution, pulling, convolution, and after all, like all these have uh, reduced it. Convolution, 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 pulling, dense layer, dense layer, dense layer. And this is actually one of the first um, um, kind of convolutional uh, layers that people realized, wait, hold on. The dense layers are still really big. Like, in fact, if you plot like the number of um, parameters for every single one, these takes up like 95% of the parameters. So 90% of the parameters is huge. And next workshop, we'll actually talk about a, 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 an, a a solution to um, the problem of the final few fully connected layers being ex incredibly massive. Um, that's actually, uh, I, I believe, something that Google Nets man managed to fix in 2014. And um, all these previous ones, despite having a lot less parameters, computationally speaking, they're actually the heaviest one. In fact, the most computationally expensive layer is actually the very first layer, because if you think about it, it's traversing the most number of pixels, it has a large kernel, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just kind of something to keep in mind. And, uh, you know, they they use a lot of really, really fancy graphics of basically showing you how the feature maps is kind of changing in size. You can kind of see, like, there's this kind of general trend in a lot of CNN network design of you want the actual size of the feature map to get small and small and small with a bunch of downsampling. But the actual number of feature maps gets larger and larger and larger because you're extracting more features. But because we're trying to abstract away these features, these the actual size of these features become much, much smaller. So, like, six by six at the end. That's very small. And, it, and they're able to do that by using a bunch of convolutional layers. Um, sometimes, you know, nowadays we use stride, but back in the days they use max pooling. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, yeah. So one last thing before we go, a little bit on um, ethics of AI. So today we want to talk about ethics on the cloud, which is like a tra training AI on the cloud. So the, the benefit of doing stuff like this is that um, this is actually part of like a bigger sort of um, a computer AI security field called federated learning, which is the this idea of instead of just training on your own computer, you're training on servers or even distributing these training tasks into a bunch of servers. In fact, what AlexNet um, did in the beginning is because back in the days, GPU memory was very limited. So to train that really deep network, what they had to do is actually kind of split the network in half in the middle and then train it on separate computers. And when they calculate the gradients, they had to kind of do that whole separation as well. 
But it kind of takes, you know, goes back into this ideal. When we're training AI on the cloud, um, there's a lot of benefits, right? Now we can do it. We don't need a big, heavy server room to do it. We can, you know, anyone can do it. And it benefits a, a lot of small businesses. But the issue is just a lot of security problems, right? So first of all, um, as more people have, have access to them, biases and ML models actually become more and more prominent, right? And a, a lot of things, a, a big part of biases actually comes from, um, a, a, a big part of biases actually comes from the data itself, right? Especially with um, data now available on the cloud, it's increasing and data available on the cloud. And a lot of them are what we call web scraped, which is basically just took them off the internet without much sort of human moderation. And it's not even a fault of the human, the lack of human moderation, because we have billions of images. It's impossible to really let um, every single image be properly moderated. Uh, be probably moderated, right? So because of that, there may be biases in ML models. I remember like one of the most famous cases was um, like like back in the days, um, a researcher showed that what like like a sort of like I think expression um, recognition model at the time that was a really popular model at the time um, showed that Asian think thinks that Asian people have their eyes closed all the time. Um, so again, that that just has to do with um, you know the the data itself, also the methods they are training it with. And most importantly, it's very difficult to regulate how small businesses use these models, but also um, it's really difficult to regulate how small businesses use these models. Um, it, it, especially since um, a lot of times, like even nowadays with things like um, Dali, um, a lot of artists aren't consenting to um, having their work being used as being, um, uh, um, having their work be used uh, um, to be part of this um, training data set for these models. And also um, for small, small businesses, they can use these models however they want in a really sort of um, uh, opaque way nowadays. And that can be um, very problematic sometimes. Uh, I guess, yeah, any questions on that? Um, okay, cool. Again, um, you don't really need to set up a Conda environment. We have Google Lab. But yeah, here's some other resources. Stanford's CS231 and a really, really great course. Um, and they, they they talk a lot about the stuff in a much more uh, much much more heavily um, mathematically. So yeah, um, thank you for coming today. We still didn't create a feedback form. Uh, we promise we will next time, even though we said that last time. But yeah, um, thanks for coming. Uh, hope you have the rest um, the rest of the week.